that you're here tonight. Amen. I'm thankful that you're here. I was thinking something Brother Tom Hayes said a couple of years ago here at the church when he was over in Ireland. He said the preacher said, uh, when you approach God, you must approach Him as omnipresent. And then he went on to say, when you approach God, you must approach Him as omnipotent. When you approach God, you must approach Him as omniscience. One old gentleman stood up and said, why don't you just call Him Father? And I got to think about that. What an intimate name that we have, the privilege of calling God. Abba. I've been studying on that for the last two or three days. The Old Testament, they could never approach God in such a manner. He was always uh, through other names of God. But oh, as a born-again Christian, we now have the privilege of the honor to call Him Father. Abba. There's something about that name, Abba. First time I had ever heard that used, I was in the Charlotte airport. And there was an Orthodox Jew there, and his little one had gotten away from him. He had gotten scared. And I could hear that little fellow holler, Abba! 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 Mom, I'm here to tell you right now, Daddy was doing a double time. And I thought to myself, that's what I want to call my daddy. I want to call my Heavenly Father, Abba. 
Oh, he, I feel that so deeply in my soul tonight. Oh, that even in, in spite of me, and in spite of the condition that we're in in the world, he's still my Abba. I can crawl up in my daddy's arms and tell him all my cares and all my wants. And when I'm sick, when I'm troubled, Abba is always there for us. I want to thank God for Abba Father tonight. Revelation chapter 20. And we've certainly been in this book for over a year now. <clears throat> and I'm not wanting to try to get too bogged down. There's a lot in this section. And I may come back to the great white throne judgment a little later. But tonight we're just sort of hitting the high spots. But Revelation chapter 20. And I want to say to you before I, I go into this service tonight our children are desperately in need of a touch of god and there's some of them under the satanic attack of satan himself now I realize there's a lot of folk don't believe in demonic activity but it is certainly real and just because you don't believe in it it does not mean that it is not so and if you'd have noticed at the coming of christ on his in his earthly ministry we see an increase of demonic activity and certainly now we're seeing a increase of demonic activity as we see his time is approaching and Satan is unleashing the hordes of hell on society so we must be much in prayer and I've been doing some study around demonic activity and demons and different things I'm gonna tell you something right now and I don't ever want to go into a situation where I'm unprepared because I don't want to be like the sons of Sceva. The sons of Sceva was casting out these devils and said in the name of Jesus whom Paul preached. And the devils jumped up and said, Paul, I know Jesus, I know, but who you are? Who do you think you are? And it uh, was so powerful that he ripped them of their clothes and they ran out naked. Uh, I certainly don't want to be ripped of my clothes and run out naked but I do want to be prepared in any circumstance that I come into the only defense that we have is the blood of Jesus it's the only defense I have I got a hold of something today as I was studying uh, around the Lord's Supper a lot of times we just use that as symbolic but I'm going to tell you something right now God gave that commandment more than just a symbolic measure let me tell you right now when you take that bread it's the body of the broken uh, Lord Jesus Christ you sick today take the Lord's Supper amen take the Lord's Supper drink of the drink of the new vine plead the blood over that it, when your children are, are are in trouble take the Lord's Supper I don't, I don't think we take it near enough here it's like we, and a lot of times if you get in that habit, it's a ritual. But I don't want it to be more than a ritual here at the church. I want it to be the literal breaking of his body and the remembrance of the blood in which he shed for us. Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On the such, the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall, go, and shall go out to deceive the nations 
which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and passed the camp of the sands about and at the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. I like it, don't you? And saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. <clears throat> it's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Can you imagine here tonight a world of no depravity? And when I talk about depravity, I'm talking about the influence of sin in men's lives. Whether we want to realize it or not, man is completely and totally depraved. There's nothing good in man. If there was no depravity in the world, there would be no prisons, there would be no murderers, there would be no liars, there would be no rapists, no pedophiles, there would be uh, uh, no such thing that would ever take precedence upon this earth. There would be no evil at all. No depravity. What a concept that it would be to live in a place where you wouldn't have to lock the doors and there would be no gun laws because they wouldn't have no guns. Uh, there would be no uh, uh, reason to even lock our doors. I, I remember when I was growing up, we, uh, we would leave the screen doors just open and nobody, we never dreamed of anybody ever coming in, but we're living in a society today that we not only have to lock every door, but we got to bar the windows. Amen. We're living in such a depraved time. Can you imagine a life that where we'd have no disasters? No hurricanes, no tornadoes, no 65 inches of snow, no uh, 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 earthquakes and tsunamis, and no uh, 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 tornadoes that would destroy the earth. I, what a place it would be to be in a place where there's no depravity and no disaster. And wouldn't it be a great place to be where there's no disease? We'd never have to go to the hospital ever again, and these bodies would never wear out. No, no cancer, no heart attacks, no uh, diabetes, uh, no Parkinson's, none of that. I mean, a pure uh, uh, society in which no one ever got sick and we would live forever and ever. Then there would be no death. Oh, wouldn't that be a wonderful place? I've preached over a thousand funerals in my day, and I'm here to tell you it has been uh, heartache after a heartache. I've never seen a funeral that I all that I was looking forward to preaching. Even even with Brother Fred, as wonderful as he was, and and the great service that we had, it was still broke my heart because I mean I was losing a loved one. Amen to that. And I found out in my days I've got more over yonder than I do here. And I'm sort of getting homesick to be where they're at and, uh, and to be where the Lord Jesus is. What a place it'll be that we will never have another casket or a, another a black draped uh, 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 funeral service. Oh, what a day that'll be uh, when there'll be no more death. In fact, I'm glad that whenever I shall be dried and every tear should be wiped away and there'll be no more heartache and no more sorrow and no more pain aren't you glad that there's coming a day that your heart will never ache amen because of what's been thrown at you upon this earth because whether we realize it or not a man that is born of this world is a man of, of a few days and full of trouble and, 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 we're, and we, we suffer upon this side but thank God amen I'm going to a place I'll never have to suffer again in fact, it tells me amen, that the suffering of this present time cannot be compared with the glory that shall be revealed unto them that love him. So whatever I have to go through down here, I tell the devil all the time, amen, do your best because where I'm going, it ain't going to happen anymore. Amen. 
And then we're going to a place where there'll be no devil. No more demons. I'll never be tempted again. Well, I'll never have to face the fiery darts and the roar of the lion ever again. Because there's not going to be a devil. You say, well, that sounds like in a utopia. I can tell you it's something better than that. It's called the millennial reign of Christ Jesus. I believe, personally, I believe in a millennial kingdom with a millennial king. If you don't care, Mark, right quickly, pull up Daniel 7, 13, because Revelation 20 is not the only place that it teaches it. Listen to this. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory. Listen to this. And the kingdom... That all people, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting kingdom which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. You cannot have a kingdom unless you have a king. And you can't have a king without a kingdom. I believe in a literal kingdom. Amen. So let's talk about it a little bit here tonight. First off, go back to Revelation chapters or 20 verses 1 and 2. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his, in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. First of all, we want to talk about the removal of Satan here. I want to say this specifically, that Satan is a real person. Okay, He's more than a cartoon character. There's a lot of people, amen, tonight that does not really, really see Satan as real. They look at him as a Bugs Bunny or a Santa Claus or a fictional character. But I'm going to tell you something right now. He's as real as God is real. Now, I realize he's not an equal opposite of God. There's a lot of people got him placed on an equal opposite basis. God, devil, God, Jesus, devil. No, 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 he's not equal opposite. All things have been put under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He has been made uh, dominion over all powers and principalities. But I want to say this to you. He is a real devil, a devil. He's a real person. And he's out to destroy you and I. In fact, the Bible said that he was a liar and the father of it. He's come to seek and destroy. Amen. Tonight, uh, um, and whom those that will, that, that will let him. Come on now. Amen. He said, I come to give you life. He said, but he's come to destroy life. He's a father, he's a liar and the father of it. He is a real person. I will say this to you. Do not mist- give him or a mistake, do not mistake him, amen, tonight as a fictional character. He is real. Come on now. He's after to destroy you. He's after to destroy this church. He's after to destroy your relationships. He's out to destroy uh, uh, families. Come on. Come on. He's out to destroy our children. He's out to destroy you. He wants to get in your head. He wants you to think like he thinks. Listen, listen. you know what's wrong with many of the depressed people in the world today is because they got stinking thinking. For as a man thinketh, so shall he be. If all you put into your mind is thinking, stinking, or, or stinking thinking, oh, that's what you're going to get out of. Paul said that when you think, he said, he said, if there be any praise, if there be any virtue, if there be any good thing, amen, think upon these things. Let me tell you, when depression, amen, begins to work on me, then I begin to think how good God is. I begin to think, of, amen, of how the Son of God, the glory, amen, tonight, the uh, glorious person of Jesus Christ, came down from heaven for my sake, amen, and died for my sake, risen for my sake. When I think about all the good things, amen, that the Lord has given me, amen, how he's fed me through the day and gave me water to drink, air to breathe, clothes on my back, when I think of how good he is, Yes, I'm no longer depressed. Come on now. Oh, let me say this to you. If, if, if you. if you're constantly thinking on the negative, you'll enter, listen, you'll enter into that depression that you can't medicate out. Come on now. Are you with me? 
So, so we see the removal of Satan. When is he removed? When is he removed? At the beginning of the thousand year millennial reign. Amen. Come on. Huh? We've already talked about the battle of Armageddon, have we not? We've seen the Lord take preeminence. He is now the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Now he's beginning to set up his thousand year millennial reign. Come on now. Now, you say, well, that, that, that phrase millennial ain't in the Bible. Well, Trinity's not in the Bible, but it is certainly so, isn't it? Come on. Missions are not in the Bible, but it teaches us to be missionaries. And so it is not mentioned as a millennial, but thank God it is there. It is an actual thousand-year millennial reign. Now look up here with me. Don't get mad at me if you're not a premillennialist. Okay? We, we, we can still fellowship. <laughs> Now, there is some what we call amillennialist. That means they do not believe in a literal millennial kingdom where the Lord sets up his thousand-year reign. There's a lot of people who don't believe that. They believe that it is spiritual, not physical. They go back to the term, well, a thousand years is a, is a day in the eyes of the Lord. They use that. There's no biblical foundation for that. Come on now, look at me. Then we have what we call the post-millennial reign. Amen. The post-millennialists believe that the, that the devil has already been chained. It tells us here, look here. Having the key of the bottom's pit and a great chain in his hand, they believe that Satan's already been chained, and we're just now living through those thousand year millennial oh, a thousand years. Listen to me. If he's chained, honey, he got a long chain. If he's chained, buddy, I'm telling you, I hate to see him loosed. Wouldn't you? I am. And I don't make any bones about it. I am a premillennialist. Now, I don't, like I said, I'm not going to break fellowship with you. Now, like, like with Brother Kenneth and Brother Garrett, they're, they're an amillennialist. We fellowship just fine together, didn't we? Okay, I don't have no problem with that. But it's just like I told my grandmother. She, she didn't believe in the, the rapture of the church. And I told her, I said, I hope me and you buried right side by side. And I said, at the day of resurrection, I said, I'm going to reach over and punch you in the, in, in the, on, the, uh, on the shoulder and say, I told you so. <laughs> Come on now. I believe in a premillennial reign of Christ. I believe that after the, 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 uh, the battle of Armageddon, he'll set his reign. I believe for a thousand years that he'll be the king of kings, lord of lords. I will rule with him. You'll rule with him. And after that thousand year millennial reign, Satan will be loose for a little season. Come on now. Now, where is he removed? Because this gets sticky. Okay. Now look here in verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he should be loosed for a little season. Let me say this to you. We're not talking hell here, okay? Now a little bit later on, what, what verse is where he's cast in? Can you pull that up? I think verse 13, Mark. Is that true? No. Verse 10. Verse 10. Verse 10. Now listen to this. 
And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now look up here now. There's a difference between the lake of fire and there's a difference between hell, and there is a difference between the abyss or the bottomless pit. Okay. Let me talk to you. You remember when Jesus went to Legion? And they said, no, don't cast us into the abyss. Don't cast us in the bottomless pit. Why, why did they ask that? Because there's some spirits that's already been placed there. That was placed there back in Genesis chapter, right before the flood. Jude teaches us that. Who left their natural abode. The abyss is a place of darkness. It's a place where I just got rid of you. Not hell, not the lake of fire, but the abyss. There's, right now, as we speak, there is evil spirits living in the abyss. In fact, over in Revelation, I believe chapter number 7, you see him opening that up. He had the keys to the abyss. Oh, oh, boy, boy I just got a hold of it, Mark. Revelation. If it's hell, who's got the keys of hell? I just got a hold of it. Jesus. Jesus said, I got the keys of death and hell. <laughs> Ain't that wonderful how the Holy Spirit does that? If it was the abyss, he wouldn't have the keys to open up for the evil spirits. So what we're seeing here in verse number 3, he has been placed in the bottomless pit to be hell for a thousand years. Are you with me? Am I right, Mark? Absolutely, I think I am. Now, why is he removed? Verse 3, back up. <clears throat> and cast him in the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him. Listen, this is why he is placed in the bottomless pit, that he should deceive the nations no more. Okay? What, what has the Antichrist and the devil and all this, what have they been doing all this time? Especially in the last day. They've been deceiving nations. That's how come they're, you know, all the war and all the torment and all that, that, that's going to be taking place in the last days. Listen to me. There will be no peace on this earth. We can say peace and safety all we want to. There'll be no peace in Israel until the king of Israel takes his throne. Amen. Amen. We've seen today or last night maybe where four Orthodox Jews was killed in the temple. Just shot down. The, ho the holy place. Oh, my goodness. It would be like them coming into our church, into our dominion, in our domain, and shooting us. But in that day, Christ Jesus will take him out of the way and he'll deceive the nations no more. Then we see the reign of the saints. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God in which they had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. We're looking first off at the power of the saints. Turn, look up Isaiah 24 for me. Because let me show you what's going to happen. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. What's going to take place? You and I, look up here. You and I, we're going to sit on thrones. I'm going to pass judgment. We're going to run things. God is going to give us. And let me say this too. It's how faithful you are to what God's called you into. To what you get to rule over. Some's going to rule in counties, some cities, 
Maybe I'll get Fort Blackamore, baby. <laughs> or Saltwall. <laughs> Amen. Cities, counties, countries. But look up here. I have, because you've been faithful over a few things, I'm going to make you ruler of many. Let me tell you something right now. It does pay. To serve the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. See, there's going to come a day when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ called the Bema Seat. And you are going to be rewarded for what you've been faithful over. And why you done it. Come on. See, there's a lot of people got a confusion about the beam of seat. They think, whoa, we're going to be judged over our sin. Well, honey, that's already been taken care of at Calvary. How much more can Jesus do for us? He already died for my sins. So what I'm going to be judged over, amen, tonight is my work and why I done it and how faithful I was to it. Amen. I want to make sure that whatever I do for the kingdom of God is for His glory, not mine. And I want to make sure that I do it with all my heart, all my soul, and all my heart and mind. Come on now. See, it's not how big a ministry you got. It's how faithful you are to the ministry. Come on. That's good stuff, ain't it? And so we're going to rule, and we're going to reign. We're going to set... On those thrones with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The martyrs, they're going to be there. The apostles will be there. The, the uh, Pentioch folks will be there. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> they will be there. The power of the saints. Then we're looking at the protection of of the saints. Look here in verse number 5. Look here. But the rest of the dead which will, will not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Listen to me. There is not anything called a general resurrection as many folks teach. Many folks teach a general resurrection as though the dead in Christ and the dead that are lost will be raised together. And that's not going to happen. There is a first resurrection. Pull up verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Thank God you better be ready mm -hmm, to be part of the first resurrection. Come on now. Every child of God, every saint of God is a part of the first resurrection. Two resurrections. There is the resurrection of the saint. And then there is the resurrection of the sinner. But, at, woo, but as a saint, I don't have to worry about that second resurrection. I don't have to worry about the second death. What's the second death? There's two types of death. Or three. There is physical death. The cessation of the body and spirit, not the cessation, but the separation. Nothing is a cessation. We're going to live somewhere. There's a separation of body, soul, and spirit. Okay. Spiritually, when I was born in sin, shaped in iniquity, I was separated spiritually from God. The second death deals with separation. The second death deals with a separation, amen, of the sinner, both Body, soul, and spirit. The, mm, the sinner is going to have a body that will never burn up, that will completely be tormented day and night, and completely be separated from God. You talk about one of the most painful things that a man could ever go through has been separated from between you and your master. Wouldn't it be an awful thing that, that completely there's no hope for you ever again? Oh. <laughs> oh, Lord, I ain't going to say that. Oh, the protection of the saints. 
Then we're looking at the purity of the saints. Listen to this. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Blessed. Here's the Father saying, blessed. Oh, blessed. I can hear the Father say, blessed. And then the position of the saints. See, look here what it says. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And shall reign with him a thousand years. What's a priest? Who was doing the activities of the temple at the time? The priest. We are the priest. This, this is another subject, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring... I'm going to bring this out. You're a priest right now. You know that? You're a priest. Not, not the high priest, but you're a priest. I have now the capability to come to the throne of God to pray. That was the, that was the capability of the Levite priest. He was the spokesperson. He was the mediator between God and man. Hmm. Thank you. Jesus said the middle wall of petition has now been broken down. And now we have been made nigh by the blood of Jesus. That means now, Hebrews 4.12, therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Oh, my goodness. So we're, we're looking at the purity of the saints, the position of the saints. But thirdly, we're looking at the rebellion of the sinner. And we're going to close here. Pull on. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Satan's released. You see that? He's in the abyss. A thousand years has ended. And now he's released. Can you tell me why, preacher? Theologically, you may tell you why. I don't know. I can't tell you why. I don't know why that God, after he would have him in the abyss, would allow him to be loosed out of his prison. But here's what I do know. Satan has not lost his character. The moment that he's let out, guess what he does? He goes and deceives the nations again. He doesn't change. Listen, he hasn't changed from the day from the beginning of the garden. You know, here's the thing. You gotta think about this. Be patient with me. There's four things that Satan has always used. Lust the flesh. Lust the eye, or three things, pride of life. You think, man, that's easy. That's simple. It is simple. He's not added to his artillery. But think about this, we still fail all the time. Lust flesh, lust the eye, pride of life. Come on now. Here's the thing, you've been at it a long time. And just as soon as he's let out of prison, he goes to the four corners of this earth and he's starting to lie again. And guess what? Man hasn't changed his character either. <laughs> you know why I like you know why I like being under the grace of God? Cuz I can't mess this up. Come on. Now look at it, church. Now, if Adam messed it up in the garden, here we are. we got a thousand years of millennial reign. The lion is laid down by the lamb. The child is laid down by the ass. The wolf by, 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 by the sheep. A thousand years of pure divine utopia. And after he's let out, we do the same old stuff. Look what it says. And they went up and breathed on the earth and compassed the camp of the saints and, below, and the beloved saints. No, wait a minute. Verse 8. To gather them together to battle. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. You'd think we know better by now, wouldn't we? To follow that stupid rascal. If there's one thing 
that I can brag about on Satan, and I don't like to brag about him at all, is he's relentless. But he's stupid, too. <laughs> Look at it. Before time was time, Jesus said, I saw him as lightning fall out of heaven. He kicked him out then. When he said, I will exalt myself above the throne of God, and I will be like the most high, all of a sudden, Jesus went, poop, drop kick. <laughs> And now he's tried it again. And again. He did it again before. Drop kick. You know where he has that access to the throne of God? I believe over in Revelation 12. Uh, immediately then. Can't come back in now. Cut off Satan. Drop kick. Now he's doing it again. Right back to where he started. Guess what? Drop kick. Stupid. The rebellion of the sinner and the sinner's response. But then we're looking at the Savior's revenge. Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented night and day forever and ever. My goodness. Oh, I can't wait to see that day. I can't wait to see that day. See the difference between the abyss and the lake of fire? The lake of fire, he ain't coming out. He's going to be there forever and ever and ever. Church, I know that we're living in, in a desperate, difficult time. But please don't get discouraged. Please don't. We're almost home, honey. We're almost home. I talked to a pastor Monday, and he's ready to give up the church. He's ready to throw in the towel. He's ready to quit. I said, please don't quit. We need you. Come on. Do you not know that we have 5,000 churches across America closing their doors every year? And we've got 5,000 Islamic temples going up every year in America let's don't close the doors let's don't get discouraged Jesus said when you see these signs come to pass look up your redemption draws nigh amen people said oh it's going to get better it's going to get better it's not going to get better look up here I want to tell you right now look up here Be it's not going to get better it's going to get wa it's going to wax worse and worse Second Timothy 3, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Where are we at? Now, ha has this come by a surprise to us? Why do we stand in, in awe and shock when we see all this coming about? We've been told this. We've been told this. And we, we are, listen to me, we are well prepared for this battle tonight. Amen. The Bible said the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. We are more than able to, to withstand and to overcome and to be victorious even in this last day. Come on now. Oh, let's don't give up. Let's don't bow our head and, amen, and say, oh, I'm, I just don't know what we're going to do. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And the same God that delivered them in the old days, the same God will deliver us today. Amen. So we're well prepared. We can take this mountain. God is a God of, of victory, not defeat. Listen to me. I can't fail. You can't fail. If I keep my eye on Him. Come on. Spirit led trouble. That's what we're in. See, There's a lot of folks who want this race to be ease, of ease. Of ease. It's not going to be, especially in this last day. 
It's going to be tough. Oh, but I'm here to tell you the Lord's going to strengthen us. He's going to strengthen us. I honestly believe that God's raising up a mighty army. Might be few. May not be a mighty, many. Oh, I can't quit. Elisha. Hey, Elisha. Man, there's enemies all around. I mean, they're numbered everywhere. What are we going to do, Elisha? Ain't that what we're hearing? There's more of them than there are us. It's what Elisha said. God Almighty, showing to my servant your mighty power. Open his eyes. See, that's what we got to do. we got to open up our spiritual eyes. Walk out of the tent of defeat. And that little old, uh, servant looked over and he said, Man, I see chariots of fire. I see them pulling the swords. There's more of us than they are of them. If God is for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you tonight. We'll be in the third chapter of the book of Ruth. And it's going to be good. I have never been so blessed in all my life from them third, first three verses. Let's come prepared. Let's come praying. Let's come seeking. Let's come asking. Amen? Come on. Lord, Heavenly Father, I love you. Thank you, Lord, for being able to preach tonight. Thank you, Lord, today for your goodness and kindness. And you're keeping power upon the face of this earth in these last days. God, I pray for every pastor today. I pray, Lord, today for every man of God that's standing in the pulpits that we do not com compromise. Lord, tonight that we don't bend or bow. Lord, I pray for every pastor, Lord, that you would strengthen them. Lord, to go on and to, amen, to, to keep uh, their faith towards the Lord Jesus. I pray for every saint. Lord, that's struggling right now. God, I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray, Heavenly Father, for every child, amen, that's in this school system that which we live. And Lord, today the bullying and all that they face. I pray, oh God, that you would protect them. I pray, Lord, today for the lost man that needs Jesus more than anything in this world. God, I pray that you would save him and they'd call upon the name of the Lord. Now, I pray right now, Lord. Help us keep the faith. Lord, help us, Lord, tonight in our discouraging time. Lord, let us have uh, the faith of a mustard seed. Lord Jesus, today to keep, Lord, today in this last hour, our hope and our, our greatness that we have in you. I love you so very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.